speakers. I, uh, I've been touched and I'm very thankful to be included in this group. And um, My story begins uh, in 1958 in Jerusalem. My father's first position overseas was there and we went there. I was nine months old. This is before CNN, before you knew about everything in the world. And unbeknownst to us, there was a polio epidemic. One night, my parents tell me the story because I was too young to remember. They came to my crib and I was crying and they remember lifting me up, and my body was kind of like a wet dish rag. It was just flaccid. And um, they called the doctor, and he came in, and they were looking to him for some kind of encouragement, some support. And then they noticed that he was crying. So if you can think about my folks at, in their 20s, 20 years old, 20-something, in Jerusalem, far from home, with a kid with polio. Where do you go from here? So polio has actually painted a picture for me. It gave me a lot of limitations, but also gave me a lot of possibilities. And today I'd like to share with you some of those possibilities. Came back to, from Jerusalem to Washington, D.C., and between the time I was three and 13, I had four operations on my legs. Um, there, was, uh, there was a doctor we had, we called him Dr. Stoneface Adams, because he had the bedside manner of a bedpan. And he said two things to me that I'll never forget. He said, one is, you'll never walk again. And that was encouraging. And, and then the, the second thing he said was, don't ever get fat. Well, I've taken that on, and so... Um, but as you can see from this chart behind me, polio affected my motor nerves, not my sensory nerves, just my motor nerves, in pretty much from my waist down. And as you can see, I have a little polio in my arm as well. That's not nice, but hey, what do you do? So, but one thing about polio that I, is, is a great thing is that, um, as you'll notice on this chart, there's a lot of circles of where I have uh, limitations. But you also notice there's no mark around here. And the reason being is polio doesn't touch the waterworks. So that's <laughs> happily for me, which is a big deal, you know, it really is. It? And, uh, my wife, who is here, would, would probably also attest to that. So, um, and anyway, so that's how I am physically. So I use my arms to do what you guys pretty much do with your legs. 
parents, my mother and father were a big part of my life, as you can imagine, but my mother really gave me some tenacity, some stubbornness that later in life she used to complain about. How come you're so stubborn and why don't take no for an answer? But the reason being is when I was going to school, when it was time for Gregory to, to start school, I went to a school for kids with disabilities. And I remember, I was just five years old, and I can remember going into this room with all these kids with different kinds of disabilities, because that's the way they did it back then. They threw soup to nuts all in the same school, and you know, you sink or swim. And, and I didn't feel like I was at home. I didn't feel that this was my place. It wasn't my neighborhood. So I told my mother that, and she said, okay, we'll, we'll try to get you into the regular school. So we went there, but the principal said, really sorry, Mrs. Burns, we like your son, but we have steps in our school. And at five years old, I was unable to go up and down steps as I am today. But my mother said, hey, look, if that's the only thing stopping him from going to school here, if he can do the steps, can he go to school? The principal had to acquiesce on that, and he said, sure. So that summer, my neighbor and my father built some stairs in my backyard, and I practiced going up and down stairs all summer long. And by the fall, I went back to school to the principal and proved that I could go to, use the steps and go to school. And that's kind of part of how I think I ended up getting into the real world, the mainstream. And that's also how I got pretty stubborn from my mother, from being pushy and not really taking no for an answer. Perhaps because I had a disability, perhaps because people would say, it's too far to you, for you to walk to the 7-Eleven to get a Slurpee. Because of these things, perhaps, I've always had a passion for movement, for getting around, getting from A to B without fossil fuels. So that's always been my passion. And I've tried all kinds of sports um, on crutches, without crutches, uh, climbed mountains. I did the Honolulu Marathon on crutches in 16 hours. Came in dead last, but I still finished it. Um, but I've done a lot of things with my arms, just trying to kind of make up for my legs. So that's been one of my big passions. It was not till I was 19 that I realized one of my best uh, abilities was in swimming. And I started in competing in what's called the Paralympics. And for those of you who know about it, it happened after the regular Olympics a few weeks later in the same venue, the same food, the same referees, all that. And we have a strict training regime, and we have a, uh, we dro doping controls and, and all that stuff. And they have what's called a classification system. And briefly, there's a class one, that's a quadriplegic, or somebody without use of their arms and legs. And that's a, then there's a class 10. That would be somebody like with a severe hangover. But actually, more probably something like, you know, maybe, maybe only missing a hand or something. So to give you some perspective, I'm a class six, so I'm somewhere in the middle. Now I can tell you what it's like to train five miles a day and cross-train and eat right and sleep right and, and represent your country and travel all over the world and, and be honored with receiving medals and all that. I can tell you all about that. But what I'd rather tell you about is one Hawaiian swimmer that I saw 30 years ago that I've never forgotten. I was in Hawaii, there was this fellow swimming, he was a class one, no arms, no legs. In fact, he'd been born without arms and without legs. He was basically a torso with a head, and he had a thumb here, and on that he had his wedding band. It's time for him to swim. They, his assistant rolled him up to the side of the pool in his wheelchair, gave him a little kick, and he boom, 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 and into the water. And here he was in the water by himself. So the guy has to hold him to the side of the pool because with no arms and no legs, how are you going to hold on to the side of the pool before the gun goes off? Gun goes off, bang, and he's off. And he's swimming. And he's swimming as fast as he can. Now remember, if you've got no arms and no legs, how are you going to swim? Well, you're going to use what you got, right? You're going to make the most of what you got. So he's using his torso. And he's going as fast as he can down the, the, the pool, right? 25 meters. Now, the thing about swimming with your face in the water is when are you going to breathe? How are you going to breathe? So the guy's now and then he goes, and he's going as fast as he can, down the pool, trying to get to the fast and then the pool. Well, tell me, the faster you go, the harder, what part of his body is going to hit the end of the pool first? So this guy is swimming, training all his life, swimming as fast as he can, to bang his head harder into the wall every time. That guy, to me, was my hero. And I said, from that point on, I said, you know, it's really what you do with what you got that matters. So in keeping with the Hawaiian, he inspired me to try to step outside my comfort zone 
And in 2006, I was able to take part in the Korea Ironman. And that was a big deal for me. That was probably the biggest physical challenge of my life. I didn't know if I could do it. It really was a throwing the pasta against the wall and hoping the spaghetti stuck. And went off to Korea, and I did manage to, to take part. Um, the swim, I thought, was no problem. The bike, 180 kilometers, that to me was a bit scary. Um, I'd never biked more than 90 kilometers in a day before I landed in Jeju Island. And uh, the marathon, I thought if I survived the bike, I could try, probably do the marathon. Um, and, I, and I managed to do the whole thing in about 13 hours. So I completed that. And it kind of, that was like, wow, I did it. And I survived. And that was kind of cool. And in keeping with the spirit of the Hawaiian, it's not what we inherit that matters, but it's what we do with what we have. And how far can we go beyond our limitations, each one of us? My other passion in life has been communications. I have a BA in communication studies. I have a master's in fine art and painting. Those things have run through my life my whole life. I've done a lot of different kind of communication jobs. I've worked for KFC and corporate communications. I've got one minute to go. Are you kidding? <laughs> You're kidding. OK. And um, wow, that's I got to communicate fast. And I wrote a book, and I lived on a boat making television documentaries. Um, and I've done a lot of things in communication, but the biggest thing in my life, the biggest passion I have is painting. So I started doing cartoons when I was a year old. Um, when I was 18, I went to college, and I remember our first figure drawing class, there's all of us in a room a bit like this, and then model came in, and so she dropped her clothes, and I was, she was naked, and I was drawing, and I, whew, I've come to the right place now. And so that was the beginning, not the beginning, but that was part of the beginning of my career as, a, as an artist. And, so I've been exhibiting since 1980 all over the world in all sorts of places. I just came back from Bali where I was painting in Ubud for two weeks. And that's my life now. I travel around the world, I paint, um, and I speak, and that's my life. And I'm very fortunate to have that. So what does the story about a little kid with polio have to do with you? I would argue that when we follow our passions and we push our limits, we inspire ourselves and others to be all that we can be. And on that note, this is how we make the world a better place.